Hey, this is Mario Go 1.18 was released a few days ago. What is new? So Go 1.18 was released on March 15, 2022. But before I show you the actual features, let me describe how you can install it on your machine. There are a few different ways to do this. You can use the typical Go install method. You can use the official packages that include Linux, Windows, Mac OS, and FreeBSD. You can wait for your, if you happen to use Linux, you can wait for your distribution to package those binaries. So you can use apt or apkey or rpm or whatever version of linux that you're using if you use mac os and if you use homebrew well that package is not yet available i'm going to be leaving a link to the pr in the description so you can follow along go 1.18 includes three major features i'm going to be briefly covering the three of them because all of them deserve their own video so as soon as those are available i will be updating the description in this video to link to those specific tutorials the first one will be type parameters, also known as generics. The second one will be VAS testing support. And the third one will be multi-module workspaces. The example of this code will be in the generics folder. If we open the file, you will notice that I implemented a really simple function called sum that receives ints. It adds those and returns the value of the result. Pretty straightforward, right? So we have... Uh, a way to call those right here and if we go and look at the actual example you will notice that it just does what it's supposed to be doing nothing crazy so let's say that we're planning to use this not only for in 64s but also for float 64 what would you do in go typically well you will just take this copy the implementation rename the function to some float literally rename in 64 to float 64 do the same thing all over again and you know now you have your float 64 sum implementation that you can use right here let me scroll up a little bit as you can see so some float and we can put 1.1 2.2 3.54 and whatever a bunch of values and if you run it it will compile and it will do what it's supposed to be doing now when I was discussing about generics, you will remember that the whole point of using the generics is to extract out the type that is being used in the logic that we're implementing. So this is the cool thing. In order to do that, what we have to do is just change a little bit. Let me get rid of these functions called some float. And we're going to be introducing a few changes in the language that begin with the square brackets. We need to define a variable name. Let's call it v, uppercase v, a type, which in this case will be in 64 because we're using that in 64 as the, one of the values in the function, we can use a V as a reference, which is sort of like an alias to the types that we're going to be supporting. So V, similarly, we return a V, and likewise, V is returned as well. So if we go and compile this, you will notice that this is still working. And the cool thing about this is that it can not only support in 64s, but it can also support float 64s. So if we go here and we add a similar code that we added before, it will still be running. So the way to change this is literally specify in 64, in 64, and I think you get the idea. Let me get rid of this. So, and we compile, I missed that one, we run, and now it works. Now, if you notice, it's actually doing here what I told you a while ago, the uh, addition of 11, the, all the values that I passed in, and it's 11.6, that's the result, that's fine, no worry about it. So if you go back to the example, you will notice that another cool thing about uh, what is implemented in Go 1.18 is that there is another package that simplifies this. Let's say we want to add support for all the numbers no matter what. We have to import a package that allows us to do that. It sort of like uh, makes things easier for us. Let me show you. This package is called Golang Org XX Constraints. And what we have to do here now, instead of explicitly specifying the types, we can use constraints, float, or, or rather, well, you can call it or, but it's not necessarily or, it's sort of like a union sort of thing, constraints, integer. 
And what is going to happen here is that if I go back to what I had before, I removed the int64. Now all the ints, no matter what, will be working with this new code. Let's run it. Undefined constraints. It's undefined because actually, uh, I believe, yep, there is a typo right here. Constraints. So if you run this again, it is going to be working. And similarly, if we decide to use, I don't know, uh, you int 32 and you int 32, which are still numbers. Let me put this like here. It will work still. So all the numbers are now included in this uh, function that we just defined. So this is sort of like the quick introduction to generics. Again, I will be digging deeper, implementing a deep dive and describing everything that generics it's all about. So now let's talk about fuzz support. Fuzzing is another testing option that allows us to introduce inputs to our tests in order to find vulnerabilities or inputs that cause crashes. Like I said in the beginning, I will be covering this in future episodes because this is a really important topic and it takes a bit to explain properly. Let's talk about workspaces. Workspaces is a bit similar to what happened before Go modules, but now using Go modules to work with multiple modules. It's sort of a way to define a workspace that includes multiple code modules that you can use for building your project. This is another video that we'll be covering in the future because it's one of those features that requires more details. Let's jump into the features or smaller features that are not necessarily part of those three. Let's see. The first one would be the Go version support that now includes details about the flags that were used when compiling the binary, the revision that was used according to whatever version control system that you use, any flags, any environment variables, and those things that are actually attached automatically when using the build command. Now, like I told you in the beginning, at the moment using goenv right here, goenv. So if I run a Go version, you will notice that I have Go 1.18. So what I want to do, and I will show you the code just for the sake of showing you, it really doesn't, it does not, it's not doing anything. But one important thing to remember is that in order for this to work, we need to use the go build command, okay? And it has to include the module name. And this is important because the module name that we're specifying right here, all of these, is going to be determining if the VCS information, the version control system information, will be included in the final binary. Don't forget that. Now, in order to use this in uh, when you're requesting the value using the coversion command, you call coversion uh, dash m and the binary name. Okay. If you're using Go, you can actually programmatically access all of this information using this package called debug slash build info. It's all included in Go 1.18. There is an equivalent for 1.17. I will be leaving the link to that one in the description as well. So like I said, there's nothing spe spectacular, nothing crazy, just printing off hello and that's basically what it is. So what I'm going to be doing, like I said, let me copy, uh, I forgot to copy the actual, or did I copy? Yep, I have right here. <clears throat> so I'm going to be building this binary using the full module name. If I do a go version dash m main, you will see that now what I have right here includes the details related to the compilation. It also includes the version control system values and obviously it includes the details related to what module was it and the version itself. If I go and change this and use something like, let's say, um, go 1.17, which I had before, so I can use my goenv local and call system. Now with this, I have a go version 1.17, which is the version that I have with uh, homebrew, okay? So I build main, let's call it main 17. Now I do go version dash m main 17. You will notice that now, because I'm using the compiler, uh, the Go tool version 1.17, all the details are now included in 1.18, obviously are not part of this binary. Now, what happens if I run Go version using 1.18 on a binary that was compiled with a lower version? So let's change Go env local 1.18, which I'm just changing my Go version, and I run the same command now. 
is going to be printing out the same values because this is backwards compatible. If I do the opposite, which is doing a Go version using 1.17 on a binary that was compiled with 1.18, it's going to fail. So let me show you. Go local system, go env local system, go env space local system, and then we do a Go version main and now it will fail because it's trying to pull data that doesn't exist in the binary. All right, hopefully this makes sense. This is really helpful because now we can use the binary information to do maybe some tracking details. Obviously, this may be a security concern because if you notice, it's including details. So be careful with the data that you're passing in when compiling these binaries. Now let's talk about another feature included in Go 1.18. This next feature considers the implementation of a new package called net slash netip that I have right here. And what this defines specifically is a new implementation of the IP type that is specifically implemented in the net package in the standard library. But this one is more efficient, uses less memory, and actually you can use it for comparing uh, or using as a key in a map, for example. It's pretty straightforward, you, depending on the things that you're building, you may or may not never use it, but if you do, I highly encourage you to take a look at this one. The way it works is, is obviously it's not backwards compatible because the standard libraries is still using most of the times the net package, so, but it's still you can use it in the future code that, are, that you're writing and maybe transform that into the net IP. A package or type that was originally implemented in the standard library. It's a small thing and depending on your use, this may be useful. The next feature is a function in the strings package called cut that it sort of replaces and simplifies many common usages of index, index byte, index run and a split n. It's sort of a way to get what is available depending of a separator. Let me show you the code. Uh, if you notice, the way it's implemented at the moment is just receiving the separator, it's just calling the strings function, and it's doing what it's supposed to be doing and printing out the value. So if we run it, you will notice that we have a few things, like there is, this is the input in all cases, this is the separator, in this case will be like a pipe, this is hello and this is nothing. What is important about this function is this, it will return true or false, if the actual separator was found. So in this case, nothing was not found, so it returns false, but in the other cases, it returns true. Now, if I look at the results that we had, like this is the result, hello world, in this case of the input, hello world, I was looking for a pipe, so give me everything that is after the pipe, in this case will be world, in this case, in the case of hello, it will give me the pipe world, because that's the separator, which is right here, so there's nothing before that. This is a cool way to get off, uh, simplify the things that when you're trying to get a piece of information in a string, highly recommended. Those are the features in 1.18 that are worth mentioning in my opinion. And like I said in the beginning, generics, fuzzing, and workspaces will be covered in independent videos in the near future. So stay tuned and as usual, take care and stay safe. I will talk to you next time. See you.